I got into something called fog ponics, and I got one of these foggers that you see at the dance floors at the raves and things like that, and used in theater production. And you put it in the water, and it would generate a fog, and the tomato plants just went crazy. Welcome to Visionary Aquaponics, a podcast dedicated to inspiring a global aquaponics movement for food freedom, water wisdom, and permaculture-inspired aquaponics. Keep listening for the best advice from the world's pioneers and visionaries in backyard and commercial aquaponics. And now, here's your host, Maribu Latour. Thank you, Gary Koffler. Thank you so much for being on the Visionary Aquaponics Podcast. I am so grateful to have you on my show. And I have a question for you. Are you ready to inspire a global aquaponics movement? I am ready. Woohoo! Great. So am I. <laughs> Okay, so I would love to know more about you. Who are you and how did you get started with aquaponics? I am a California native, grew up in Southern California during the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, moved to Northern California in the 80s, and uh, I've always been kind of a uh, an aquaculturist, kept fish tanks for many, many years, took care of fish tanks for the rich and famous of uh, Southern California and the studios and things like that. And uh, moved to the San Francisco Bay Area in the middle 80s and got involved with a company up here doing some computer systems. And it's always been kind of my dream not only to, to grow things, but to hook up my two hobbies, computers and and fish. So I put together a computer monitoring and control system for a 55-gallon tilapia tank. I got into aquaponics sort of 23 years later. What happened was our expert system that was monitoring and controlling the tilapia tank was connected to rules that I had put into it on what it should do given certain conditions in the tank. So one day, my partners and I were standing out on my balcony, and we noticed it was fall, and three of the trees outside my office were going dormant for the winter, except for one of them, which had bright green leaves and seed pods, and we're like, what's with that tree? And it turned out that one of the rules that I put into the system was to dump 10 or 15 gallons of nutrient-rich water over my balcony to the base of this tree. So I was doing aquaponics 23 years ago, but I didn't know about it. I didn't I didn't understand it then. And about three years ago, one of my partners uh, contacted me and asked me if I wanted to get back into that. And I said, what, computer-controlled aquaculture with expert systems? He said, no, aquaponics. And I said, what's aquaponics? And here I am. Wow. So you got started with computers and in aquaculture, and you discovered how just by accident that when the water, the nutrient-rich water was dumped, it was an amazing fertilizer. That's correct. In fact, at one point, I put some of it into a bottle, and I was handing it out to people, some of that nutrient-rich water into the bottles and handing it out to people, and they were using it in their gardens to help grow their tomatoes. And as a, an aquarist, I, I always knew that you take the water changes that you do, and you water the house plants, and the house plants love that water. So what are you doing currently with aquaponics? Well, currently, my job is as an IT coordinator for a large uh, Bay Area nonprofit. My aquaponics involvement is as a self-ordained aquaponics evangelist. Oh. And I take, I take that from a guy named Guy Kawasaki, who was a Macintosh evangelist back when the PC was dominant to computer and the Macintosh came out. It took a lot of education and publication of information to consumers to understand why the Macintosh was a, a good choice for your personal computer. I think Sylvia Bernstein actually coined the, the phrase as well for herself as an aquaponics evangelist. So right now I'm transitioning from the computer world into the aquaponics world because the people that I'm running into, as you call them, the visionaries and the what else did you say about these pioneers folks? Pioneers and the activists. pioneers. They remind me very, very much of all the people that I met back in the late seventies during the Apple II days. Same kinds of enthusiasm, dedication, and wanting people to to realize this is this is the place to be and the thing to do. So I decided that being an aquaponics evangelist would allow me to be in the this nascent industry and to take advantage of relationships with people that I would meet. So to that end, I've attended. 
three conferences so far. I've attended courses given by three of the top aquaponic system engineers, uh, John Parr, David Rosenstein, and Max Myers was my first, my first course uh, that I took on, on aquaponics. And then I've read all the documentation, literature, watched all the uh, YouTubes, and uh, finally realized that the best way to learn was by building my own system, which I, I ultimately did. Awesome. This whole time, you know, you've gone from aquaculture and computers and automation and everything back into aquaponics and growing your own system. What has got you pumped up about aquaponics the most? You look around now and you see that this might be the right place and the right time to be into this. I've had a history of doing things before it becomes the popular thing to do. You, you meet resistance and uh, then you have acceptance and then it becomes obvious, things like this. I was doing virtual reality back in the 80s and now 23 years later, it's becoming a, a resurgent uh, technology, a lot of investment money. The game conference I just went to, lots of virtual reality. 3D printers, I got into that. Drones, the same thing. But this not only, again, and feels like the right place at the right time, but it looks like it's got legs and there's lots of outside factors contributing to what I believe will be its success, the, give it, be it the water shortage, be it food uh, security and scarcity issues and food deserts. Uh, all these things are, are combining to make this what I think is going to be a super, super large opportunity for everybody. Definitely. I, the biggest reason for me why I've gotten into this is because of drought and water water scarcity. And, you know, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, so water is a huge issue. And learning how to farm in the desert is an issue. And food deserts and places without nutrition and people who have diabetes and obesity. I mean, these problems can be solved if we had more access to organic fresh foods without worrying about how much water it's taking and there's definitely, you know, less labor involved, especially when you, you know, you talk about automation and uh, how you can set it up with computers so that a lot of the work is done for you. And certainly a lot of that work is being done in Arizona at the Closed Environment Aquaponics Aquaculture Center, Agriculture Center, excuse me. New Mexico, Arizona, you're used to having these kinds of water shortages. Here in California, though, we've been asleep at the wheel on this one. And in fact, yet just a couple of days ago, NASA released some footage and some information from their data that California could run out of water in one year. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's huge. This is huge. huge. This is such a huge deal. And the world needs to change the way that we do agriculture. We're just like diverting water from rivers that are drying up and you pumping them into really inefficient agriculture systems. Aquaponics is so perfect for inner city rooftop, indoor or school grown gardening systems, you know, where you just have so much more control over the amount of water that you're using. And, you know, in your experience, how much water have, you know, have your systems been able to save compared to what you would grow in the ground? Well, let's talk about the systems that, uh, that I'm familiar with. And it's only because uh, last August, uh, I was given an opportunity to help John Parr and Sundown Hazen, the founders of School Grown in uh, Half Moon Bay, build a model system, a demonstration system that John had designed that includes both deep water culture and wicking bed and a large tank full of sturgeon. It's only been operational now for, what, six months? And I don't know that they have the exact numbers, but certainly it seems that the numbers that we hear about, better than 90% uh, savings in water use, uh, seems to be correct. Uh, I know I visited a, uh, a trout hatchery down in Southern California, and they're drawing water from the aquifer, and uh, nearby farms have got those sprinklers just spreading water into the air as they water crops, and they just flow... Yeah, just flow through system going out into a creek, which is home to just all kinds of wonderful birds and plants and fish before it heads out to a watercress farm. And it's just very inefficient use of water. And certainly aquaponics is a very efficient use of water. Yeah. So actually, I really want to know more about this system that you've been involved with. Is it the main project that you've been involved with, uh, building with John Park? Is that the largest facility uh, in, uh, of aquaponics in uh, California at the moment? Well, certainly, uh, my involvement with John came as a result of uh, visiting him in Monterey at the uh, Watsonville Viridis Farm, which he designed and built with a partner down there. And they were, uh, I don't know the exact square footage. In fact, I'm going to leave a lot of that for John to explain when you get him on one of your interviews. 
but they were absolutely producing uh, more than 5,000 heads of uh, lettuce per day and selling it through the uh, surrounding uh, restaurants and farmer farmers markets. So he absolutely uh, had the biggest at that time. I don't know if there are bigger ones now. Uh, I will say that I, I, I've seen a lot of farms, both on the tours that I've gone to on the the conference and other ones that I've visited. But what got me really involved with John primarily lately is one, his proximity to me. He's just down the road in Half Moon Bay. I'm currently in Petaluma, California, up above San Francisco. And because he he put together a model that is not only self-sufficient in the terms of the biology, the plants and the fish, but also presents a financial uh, model that is uh, self-sustaining and looks like it will produce a return on investment in one year. Now, again, I'll save a lot of this for both Sundown and uh, John to tell on, on their interviews with you. But the model is designed so that a school can set one of these things up. They're portable, so it can be set up and torn down. It's a three-year lease, and the idea is after one year, the produce sold to the students' families and the surrounding community of restaurants and farmers' markets and such will return enough investment to pay for itself, and then the following year, enable them to set up another system. So you get a logarithmic growth of these systems supporting the uh, establishment of new systems at schools here in California to start, but pretty much anywhere uh, that a school board decides they would like to try this out. And... It's a leaf system. We describe it as a living ecosystem aquaponics facility, and the uh, tagline we're using is add a leaf to your stem. So we're involving the all the biology classes at the schools. They're learning about the fish growth. They're learning about uh, the plant growth, horticulture, the biology of the microbes and the bacteria. And even the economics departments are getting involved because they'll be responsible for uh, keeping track of the, uh, the the production values of the system. And then we're also at the uh, – we, our first system is going in in April, just about two weeks, at the Felton, California, San Lorenzo – high school and they've got a regional occupational program there and the students will actually be building the greenhouse and all of the aquaponics systems that is awesome i love it i love that you guys have a model that works and that is gonna you know allow a financial sustainability for the schools to take on a project like this and to get the students involved in learning the biology and the ecology and you know all about that i mean that's amazing that i would really love to start something like that here Are you guys thinking about branching out nationally or providing course development or organizational development for people who want to start something like this in another state? Absolutely. I mean, arguably, John Parr is one of the country's leading aquaponic system engineers. We give courses at the school grown one facility in half moon bay the courses are aquaponics one aquaponics two i'm taking my aquaponics three course at the end of this month and he's also going to be giving a course about teaching the teachers so that people can go out with confidence and give presentations and hand out the presentations off of a little flash drive so they too can spread the word and that's my that's my kind of one of my titles at uh, school grown i'm started out as a national regional representative for school grown but my card is going to say chief aquaponics evangelist yeah it's so good to have you here on this interview and um, you said you started your own aquaponic system is that correct yeah i realized that I was spending a lot of time. I took, like I said, those three courses with these top guys, Max and John and David uh, Rosenstein down in uh, Los Angeles. He's got a great system down there using Nate Story's vertical aquaponics uh, systems. And just it was taking a lot of time, learning a lot of stuff, but it was all paperwork. Uh, It was all the visuals of what other people were doing. And I realized that once I built my own system, that I'd probably learn a lot more. So I built a patio ponics system, which was outside my uh, door where I lived. And... I thought I'd want to set up a couple of ways of doing this so that I could demonstrate it and learn more about each system. So I started off with a stock tank, which they use for cows to uh, get their water during the day. And I filled that with koi and goldfish because they were hardy and would withstand the cooler temperatures up here. And uh, above that, I hung three-foot vertical towers, Nate's Towers. And I purchased a a rack, a framework, if you will, to hang the towers from at the bottom place, the tank. And there was some space in between, about 24 inches of space. So in that space, I put a couple of Rubbermaid totes 
One of them I filled with hydroton, and I was doing a flood and drain system in that one. And the other one I was going to float a raft on. So I'd have a demonstration of all three of the more popular methods. I never really got around to the raft system because it didn't really hold a 4x8, a 2x4 panel. But what I did do is I got into something called fog ponics, and I got one of these foggers that you see at the dance floors, at the raves, and things like that, and used in theater production. And you put it in the water, and it would generate a fog. And I had the plants coming through the uh, raft above that, and a lot of air underneath there. And the tomato plants just went crazy. They just they just loved the fog. So, so like it aeroponics. Was, it was like aeroponics, except they are now calling that fog ponics because aeroponics also includes the spraying of the liquid nutrients into the root systems. And there, there are clogging issues with that. And I didn't find any clogging issues with the uh, transducer that was creating the vibrations, which broke the water into a into into a vapor, into a mist, if you will. Mm-hmm. So uh, the idea was just to build something so I would uh, be familiar with what the uh, problems would be and what would be successful. And I'd have stories to tell about, like the time it got to 27 degrees after Christmas and December and when the uh, system came on it popped one of the uh, valves that broke it and water went all over the place you learn more when you actually start doing your own system and I encourage everybody to set up their own system to the level of the space they have and the and the budget they can put together to do it yeah definitely. that's how you learn yeah that's how I'm learning too I mean I'm designing my own passive solar greenhouse here that's uh, go. going to be impermanent it's going to be something that I can move. So it's really testing my design capabilities because my criteria is so uh, limited. It can't be permanent. There's no concrete foundation. I have a limited budget. I need to be able to move it when I'm, when I'm moving to some other house. And I want it to also be a really great demonstration for people and possibly a, a place to do, you know, intro to aquaponics for my neighbors and my local Santa Feans here who are interested. Because right now, there's really nothing locally except the community college. If you want to go take a, a whole semester long or two semester long courses to go learn aquaponics, you can you can totally do that. But I like the idea of having a one day or a two day or three day course where you can literally go walk into a greenhouse and take a look at the systems and see how the pumps and the, the plumbing works and look at the fish and the ratios of the plants to fish and all that. So I, I'm learning a lot just by designing a greenhouse with all That's these criteria, learning about the renewable energy. I mean, how am I going to save money and use the most amount of sunlight right now? We have an amazing year-round sun, but we have such little water. So aquaponics is perfect for this area. One of the first lessons I learned, and I learned this from David Rosenstein's class, is there really are no experts in aquaponics because it all is dependent. There are so many variables. It's all dependent on where you set it up, what your water is you're going to use, what water source is, what your plants are you're going to grow, what fish you're going to grow, how the plumbing is going to work, what your natural resources are for actually building the system. Are you going to use maybe solar, AC or DC pumps? There's just so many variables that there can't be anyone that says this system will work uh, for everyone. And the other thing I've learned is that biology finds a way. The smaller the systems, the bigger systems, biology will work with whatever parameters you've given it to work in. If you overfeed your system, things are going to happen. If you underfeed it, things are going to happen. So it's it's a very flexible kind of environment to work in, which is why a lot of the people are trying to computerize and monitor. They're sticking with hydroponics because when you introduce the fish and the biology that takes place in the plant roots, that produces a whole lot more variables that you need to monitor and it's it's tough to control Mother Nature. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely more complex, but it's closed loop. And I think that we need to head that in that direction if we're really going to heal the planet. We really need to stop thinking about consuming things outside our systems and dumping them. And that's why I, I love aquaponics because I'm actually a permaculture freak. I love there you go. permaculture. I'm really into closed loop systems and I'm into the whole big picture of how are we going to heal the land? How are we going to heal Mother Earth and our river systems and all that? And one way that we, we can do that is at least by stopping really inefficient agriculture practices and replacing them with holistic land healing practices like growing more trees and 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 preserving our water sheds and and definitely aquaponics using aquaponics to grow more of our annuals instead of using our landscapes to grow annuals which could really be growing fruit trees and all kinds of trees that will last us hundreds of thousands of years without any human input i think that's where we need to go and this is certainly max meyer's mantra and he recently gave a, a seminar which i would encourage all of your listeners 
to uh, watch. You can come up with the, I don't know if you saw it or not, but I you can up the link it. for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, with any resources that we have, I, I want to promote all the teachers out there and leaders who are leaders in the global aquaponics movement. What advice do you have for the aspiring aquaponics entrepreneur who's never built a greenhouse or built a business, but is super passionate about aquaponics? Well, right now there's there's several directions you can go. Everything from the, the smallest systems that you've seen at pet stores where you've got one Siamese fighting fish or a goldfish growing a couple of maybe six plants above it, just by doing that, you're going to learn a lot of things. I would certainly not try to set up a 5,000 square foot greenhouse as your for, as your first system, but there's plenty of plans out there on the internet, plenty of publications that describe systems that will accommodate pretty much any budget and, and amount of foot, square footage you have available to set something up. So, I mean, the simplest systems, of course, are the flood and drain systems, although I'm not a huge fan of, of the bell siphon, because mm-hmm. when those those fail, you end up with you end up with issues. But there there are plenty of designs for doing those systems. Wicking beds are wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I just would just say you gotta get your excuse the expression, you gotta get your feet wet mm-hmm. and your hands and your hands a little dirty. And and that's 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 what they should do. Yeah. Definitely. That's number one. There's too much theory and too many videos out there to get distracted by. You just got to pick something and start designing and building it. And of course, there's the standard book. Sylvia Bernstein's book is really good. There's a, some really good official type videos that are out there now from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and some of the regional aquaculture and agriculture. There's a pretty much uh, go over all the, uh, the basics of, of what they need to know before they set up their own system. So how do you close the loop or go beyond the production of food and medicine to produce or harness some of those other elements in your systems if you do? Uh, that's an excellent question. And that is something that John has always been striving to do from, from two standpoints. One is to make the systems as simple as possible. And the other is to provide that economic viability. So to that end, a lot of his system design has been oriented around capturing outputs of one system and making them inputs into another system. Again, that's Max's mantra as well. To that end, he's formed an association with a project called Soliculture that was developed with between a in a partnership between NASA and the University of California at Santa Cruz. And they've developed a solar panel that actually covers half the greenhouse. And not only is it capturing sunlight and turning that into photovoltaic energy, but the coloration of the panel itself only permits the certain light frequencies that the plants require to come through the panel and the other higher wavelength frequencies don't come through. And those frequencies are generally associated with the heating of the of the greenhouse. So it keeps the greenhouse a little cooler. The panels are not on the entire rooftop so that in the morning when you want your greenhouse to warm up, it, the sunlight is coming through the clear panels, There's clear glass panels or the, or the uh, plastic film that's covering the greenhouse. So he's, he's looking at that as a uh, way to help bring down the energy costs. And certainly if you use DC pumps to move the water around and, or and he's now also looking at air pumps because air pumps can be real valuable. Glenn Martinez in Hawaii has shown how air pumps uh, can move a lot of water for a very low uh, energy requirement. So there's a a use there. Just reading articles recently about uh, vegetable-based protein foods for the fish. So we're not required to go and harvest huge amounts of trash fish out of the oceans in in order to create food for for the fish. Obviously, composting is is big in in our planet, school grown. All of these things are very uh, permaculture-inspired and let Mother Nature do what she's been doing for millions of years. Yeah, I love that. You know, aquaponics is so young that we're still developing ways to improve the systems, even as they're so efficient. When combined with these other renewable energies, it is like the supreme, most efficient type of growing system. Seems that way to me. Yeah. (laughs) I'm really interested about the airlift pump. I I was studying Glenn's work as well. Do you know much about about that, about the airlift pump? You know, I do not. I have been at two of the conferences, the the Denver conference and the Tucson conference, as well as the one we had here recently in San Jose, where he gave demonstrations. And it's so simple in its operation, but watching him 
demonstrated is he's like a magician. And I, I feel like I have to watch it two or three more times to really get an understanding of what he's doing. And there again in your show notes, you should probably list a video that Glenn produces that, that shows his paradise uh, in Hawaii where he's using those to bring water up from the local creeks and into the system. Yeah, I've definitely taken a look at all his videos and he is just Awesome. If you had to start over with only a thousand dollars, what would you do to build a an aquaponics business from the ground up? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Tough one to answer because my primary interest in doing aquaponics has been to evangelize it because like my previous career as a computer software developer, I realized that learning how to program myself and taking the time to program a product take longer than if I were to hire five or six programmers to write programs of my design or our mutual design. So I kind of felt the same way about aquaponics. I wanted to uh, associate with somebody that had experience doing this. So the $1,000 that I had was originally used to go out and, and learn from those people at the courses and attend the conferences and get as much information as I could to build a, a small system myself. But um, I have a picture of myself holding up uh, a strawberry from my patioponic system that was doing vertical and and deep water culture and fog ponics and and had all the fish in it and I spent about eight hundred dollars to to build that and I held up my first uh, eight hundred dollars strawberry but I, I learned a lot from doing that so I think that's what I would do is I'd go out and buy a stock tank and invest in some of those uh, vertical towers try those out build a uh, a bed of gravel or a wicking bed and get some fish and and just and just do it just the best you can do from what you learn by what you read and what you see on the internet Mm -hmm. And so if you were trying to make money with a small system like that, what would you say are the top three crops in your experience in your local market that have really proven to be really financially sustainable for a business, for an aquaponics business? Well, again, Viridis was was growing all sorts of lettuce crops, and that seems to be the the main crop that these aquaponics farmers are concentrating on because they're just floating in the rafts. They don't require a whole lot of attention and, and they return a pretty good return on investment because they just, they seem to taste really good and they don't have as many disease and insect issues as field grown crops. Basil, they are, they're growing those. I haven't looked into it a lot. As I told you, my background is really from the aquaculture side of things. So I'm more the fish guy and I'm learning now more about the, the plant side of things. But originally, I was drawn to the idea of the microgreens. They seem to draw a fairly large return on the investment for markets that want to sell these tiny sprouted little lettuce and other kinds of vegetables in, in a very early stage of growth. So you're, you're doing a pretty quick turnaround because they're not having to grow a full 30 to 45 days like a full head of lettuce might require. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other specialty crops. I know my, one of my friends has asked maybe a wasabi. Wasabi goes for an incredible amount per pound. I'm not sure how well it's going to do in uh, aquaponics. So you, you really have to, that's a tough one. I haven't done that myself yet. I haven't investigated which uh, crop does the best return on investment for the amount of time and energy and resources that have to put into it. When you get John Parr uh, on your interview, I'm sure you'll get the definitive answer from him. Thank you. And also, if there was one aquaponics grower or mentor you'd want to spend a week with to learn from, who would it John be? Parr. John Parr. Did I, did I take a long time to to think that. I had occasion to meet uh, Dr. Ricosi in the lobby of the Sheraton Hotel in Denver prior to the evening of his keynote speech. And I recognized him even though he was in his flip-flops and and shorts and Hawaiian shirt. And I said, excuse me, but aren't you uh, Dr. Ricosi, the rock star of aquaponics? He then quoted that encounter that night in his keynote. And apparently that name has now stuck. It's either the rock star or godfather (laughs) of aquaponics. And as many of your listeners may know, Dr. Ricosi is the guy who started aquaponics system in the University of the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. And he quantified all of the activities of the system that he produced. And it's become sort of a standard system that most aquaponic uh, pioneers have used to set up their systems. And people have made various uh, modifications, the friendly system and green acres and all those guys. And again, depending on where they are and what they're growing and what their resources are, they've made these modifications. 
modifications. But even though Dr. Ricosi, uh, who's semi-retired now, certainly started all this, he himself acknowledges the fact now that there's been a lot of advancements now in the field in the years since he did this back in the, I guess it was the 70s maybe, I don't even know. And I feel that John has certainly embraced the gathering of the most efficient ways to, to try and do this that maximizes the yield of your plants and minimizes your losses. And my long-term goal is to capture the expertise of someone like John into a computer monitoring and control system so that somebody doesn't have to do the three years of research and watch all the videos and go to all the conferences and the seminars that I did in order to find some success by being guided through a process that's tailored to what it is that you want to do, what you want to grow, where you're going to do it. And so in the future, I don't know how far down the line, I'll have a uh, John Parr in the box and people will be able to buy that along with their supplies to grow a an aquaponic system up from scratch. That's my long-term goal. Where do you see the future of aquaponics going the next 20 years? Oh, wow. (laughs) If someone had asked me in 1978 when I got started in the microcomputer business what would be happening in 20 years, and now it's almost 40 years later, and certainly some of the things we imagined back then certainly have taken place, artificial intelligence, voice recognition, all these wonderful virtual reality technologies are just now starting to emerge 40 years later. I would like to see what happened maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago that Philips produced a prototype of a system that you would have in your kitchen. And I think I even watched something just last night about a future where you would grow all of your vegetable requirements in something the size of a refrigerator. And there will be systems that will be growing vegetables within the store that you're shopping at. So they're not being transported and utilizing fossil fuels to bring them in from great distance and requiring them to be sprayed with gases so that they can maintain a uh, freshness by the time they hit the stores. I think those things are going to happen. I think uh, we will have uh, better definitions of what's required for aquaponic systems for whatever location and resources you have to do them in. And that's, again, my, my goal is to be able to do that interactively. What kind of plants do you want to grow? How big is your system? Where's your water coming from? And, and there'll be hopefully lower cost sensors that will allow the system to help somebody do that because I just don't see the mass populations going to as much education and experience that John and I and others have had to go through to, to approach successful operations of an aquaponic system. So I'm hoping that's what the future will be bringing us. I definitely share a lot of that dream. And I've been dreaming up having in-house aquaponics restaurants and juice bars. There you go. You could go to a smoothie shop and get your wheatgrass clipped right there and your strawberries, all of the the different little parts, you know, your kale and your shard, throw it right into the blender right there, (laughs) fish below the counter and... I mean, that is a dream come true. And, and going to a restaurant where you could, you could order pizza and the basil right there and the tomatoes right there or growing on the rooftop or in the back in a pasta solar courtyard inside the restaurant that people can look at while they're eating. I mean, these are all things that I think we need to incorporate into our modern And I think right that now. will happen. And I think you should come out to California. There is a greenhouse in Southern California where that's exactly what the chef is doing. You sit down at the table, the waiters go and take the orders and they walk uh, nearby 10 feet away and they pluck the greens necessary for your, for your salad. I know all of the plants and vegetables that I want to grow are the ones that will help me make my omelets in the morning and my salads at night and my kale chips uh, for snacks. So that, that's my concentration for, see, again, I started in the computer industry where it was all commercialized, huge mainframes. And then the Apple II came out. My friend, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs created that and you had personal computing. So yeah, I want to see personal aquaponics. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're on our way and we're definitely, in, we're, we're at least sharing the vision and And I think some people are going to be smart enough to do this. They're going to take this idea and run with it. Hopefully we can train enough teachers out there to do this kind of work. So that's my goal. And as an evangelist, aquaponics evangelist, that's what I am promoting. That's what I am encouraging. And that's what I will do myself. But again, once I get more experience myself, I mean, I'm right now pretty well book learned and uh, experts have uh, taught me a lot of things, but I know there's just so many, many more things I need to, to yet learn before I bring in throngs of people to teach them about aquaponics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, what I imagine is something kind of like permaculture core, but aquaponics core, where we start actually training people on sites, different kinds of systems, hybrid systems, vertical media, grow bed, you know, all that stuff, floating raft beds. 
and have some way to make this kind of like a core operation where we have crews all around in different states that know how to do this stuff. So, so we've got people who are specialized, just like people who can fix computers. We got people who can build any type of aquaponic system and, and they, they work together and we got crews to help build at schools or in people's homes and they can help you check your pH or fix your system. And that, I mean, ideally that is what I'd like to see happening. And that's exactly the course that School Grown has taken. I encourage everybody listening to this to go to the schoolgrown.com website. Not only does it describe what it is that School Grown is doing, but it's a wonderful resource for things that other people are doing as well. And we are developing crews that can go out and do this, and as well as teaching the students who are installing these on their campus. So when they go out after school, after they graduate, they can go out and do this themselves and start their own little business to do this. Awesome. Now, for the little kids listening to this right now, how would you describe <laughs> aquaponics to a nine-year-old? It's Aquaponics is a fairly new kind of uh, endeavor. It's only been around for a thousand years. The uh, Chinese discovered that if you dug a hole in the ground, you filled it with water, you put some fish in there, and you fed the fish, within a couple of weeks, you'd notice that there were plants and things growing around the edges of that hole in the ground filled with water, this pond, if you will. And that was happening because the wastes from the fish from breathing and excreting the ammonia was being converted into fertilizers for the plants around the pond. So what the Chinese would do is they would take their buckets and bring out some of that water and take it over to their crops that were growing nearby. What aquaponics is today is pretty much that simple system. We're replacing the buckets with pumps and we're trying now to find out a, a better understanding of the processes that take place in that pond so we can harness them to grow more plants, more healthy plants for people. And that, that's what I tell people when I begin any kind of uh, discussion about what aquaponics is. Awesome. What is the one thing that got you so excited about aquaponics you just couldn't wait to get started? I guess it was the fact that it combined two of my passions and hobbies, if you will, the fish aspect of it which is what I did during my, God, it started my elementary school days, junior high and high school. I always had fish tanks. After high school, I was taking care of fish tanks for people, and that was helping to pay for my college education, which even though it was a business major, I found myself going to the local libraries and finding out everything I could about aquaculture. So I knew I wanted to do the aquaculture thing somewhere down the line and grow things. But as I got into computers, as I shifted over into computers, uh, I didn't have a fish tank anymore. I, I know that the last summer when I found myself cleaning out a fish tank to put some fish in it, it reminded me so much of my old uh, days as a hobbyist in the aquarium. So I like the fact that this combined my two interests, computers and fish, and there was technology to be applied to aquaponics. And since technology is my background and the people that I know are technologists and now, of course, aquapon aquaponics, do we call them aquapons, aquaponists? Uh, yeah. Aquapons or aquaponists. Aqu I don't know. It's too much, but aquapons, I guess. Yeah, but the favorite one I've heard recently was what, an aquaponic goddess? Aqua go me, aqua me. Uh, Yeah, you. That's my, that's my name. Aquaponist yeah. goddess. Aquapodis is what I call Aquapodis, myself. Aquapodis, that's what Aquapodis. I heard. Aquapodis, yes. That's but, the name uh, I invented. <laughs> as soon as I realized that the people that I was meeting were just like the people that grew the industry, the microcomputer industry, uh, almost 40 years ago, that's when I really wanted to jump in. And when I realized that there's going to be pH to be measured, there's instruments for that, dissolved oxygen. I used to go around to aquarium stores and take uh, water measurements for them to help them better display and maintain their aquariums at the, at the retail level. So I had a Bosch & Lowe mini spectrophotometer, which allowed me to do carbon dioxide measurements, pH, ammonia, nitrites, nitrates, uh, phosphates, sulfates, calcium, hardness, all these things. And that was just, I love that kind of stuff. So my retirement year is coming up to be able to do these kinds of things. Do I'm doing physical work in the greenhouse, uh, not as much as some of the younger guys are doing, but I'm also helping to direct some of the uh, work. And I want to be able to do that with the kinds of crews you said will be available to set these systems up. So if I'm not monetarily successful and make a fortune, which I'm not looking to do, I'm eating healthier. I'm discovering new tastes. I don't know if you're familiar with ice plants. Excuse me. 
ice lettuce, not to be confused with the ice plants you see growing on the uh, roadside, but ice lettuce from uh, South Africa, an amazing vegetable. Every time I go to the uh, farm, I have to pick some leaves and, and, and put them in my mouth, and they're supposed to taste like bacon when you roast them, and mm-hmm. they've got a salty taste to them, and they're, they're an amazing plant. So all these things made me decide that this is where my next 20, 30 years of my life are going to go. What is your favorite crop to grow right now in your system? Again, right now our system is growing the lettuces. We've got some, we've got some tomatoes growing. We've got carrots, basil. We've got a banana plant out in the back that's kind of struggling a little bit. I'm not sure why that's happening. But again, I brought home a bunch of fresh kale recently. But I guess my favorite would be that, that ice lettuce. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I would encourage your, your listeners to, to find a place that sells the seeds. They're a little expensive, but it, it's worth it. If if you knew what you know now about starting an aquaponics business back then, what one piece of advice would you give to aspiring aquaponics entrepreneurs? Well, again, even though I alluded to the fact that the model that School Grown has um, built and is um, working with right now looks to be self-sufficient after about a year, uh, its return on investment. One thing that any project requires to start up would be uh, some kind of uh, initial capital. I mean, it's like you drill a hole to get to the water down in the ground, you install the pump and you either start hitting on the lever to pump up the water or turning on the uh, pump to bring up the water from the ground. And it just doesn't happen because you need to prime the pump. You need to actually add some water before you can draw the water reserve that's underneath the ground. I see aquaponics in that kind of state right now in a lot of places because it is a capital intensive way of producing plants and fish. You need the tanks, you need the pumps, you need the plumbing, you need the, the valves, you need the you need all these things that cost money up front. So unless you can kickstart something, and I've only seen a couple of Kickstarter pro- projects, this uh, beta tank I t- talked about earlier, that was a Kickstarter where they built a small three-gallon tank, I think, with uh, grow pots on the top. They raised millions of dollars. I, I think I was watching Game of Thrones that day because I, I could have thought about that, and uh, but I didn't. So, But the other thing that's happening, I'm noticing now, is that some institutional investors uh, are pumping some serious money into – an aquaponics venture in New Jersey. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars. So I think some of the investors are doing their homework and they're looking around. And while they're not seeing any runaway successes in commercial aquaponics yet, they see the potential is there and they are funding an aeroponic system in New Jersey. Uh, it's admittedly hydroponic based, but it's, uh, I think it's just a matter of time now before you mention aquaponics to people and they don't think hydroponics and they don't think cannabis and there'll be a legitimization of the industry and mm-hmm. there, there will be more successes. And School Grown is hoping that there'll be one of those success stories that people will point to and that the students that had their successes in high school will go on into college, study more, and produce future commercial commercial systems. So right now, I think that's one of the, the, the detrimental effects of the nascent industry is the the investments into producing commercial systems. Yeah, so this is kind of a, kind of a limiting uh, threshold for a lot of people who do want to start commercial systems. Capital is definitely a huge issue. Besides Kickstarter, which I've seen a few aquaponic Kickstarters out there, and most of them were unsuccessful because they were asking for Correct. a lot of money, and there some of them were brilliant, brilliant, brilliant projects, uh, and some of them were just not very well developed or didn't have a great gifting system or it didn't seem like they were so planned out. So what is your suggestion for how people um, who have really great ideas and have a great plan can access the money, the capital to get started, even in a very small way. Okay. I think uh, this question is going to be best answered by Sundown Hazen. Sundown is a, um, was a former Apple genius. He was actually a lead genius with Apple a corporate. He basically taught the geniuses at the, your local Apple store. He left a 10 year career there to start up, School Grown with John Parr. And he is the one who is responsible for the wonderful website that they have. And he is now well along in a barn raiser funding campaign. So I would suggest that everybody go to the School Grown site and look for updates on the barn raiser for an example of how the model that they produced 
may lend itself to a more successful fundraising campaign than it has been that has happened in the, here in the past. But then from then from from just your own ground roots efforts, certainly there's enough video out there to show to potential investors, be they family friends, people who run other businesses. I know I would love to see executives at Google, Apple, Facebook embrace aquaponics because it represents a way to feed their employees. It represents big data that's being necessary to gather all of the information about being successful in aquaponics and then processing it in a way that you can use that big data to come up with a strategy for your own particular system that you'd want to build. Google's chief engineer is a man named Dr. Ray Kurzweil, and recently his uh, newsletter published a an article suggesting that the future is about big data. The future of agriculture is about big data and something he calls ag bots. And these agricultural robots are actually currently w- wandering the fields, in, agricultural fields in Australia. And with their sensors, they're able to ascertain all of the necessary environmental factors for high yields of plant growth. They can identify weeds from the plants and actually remediate and get rid of those weeds, add particular kinds of nutrients immediately directly to the plant that they're currently observing. So if they sense a little bit of an iron deficiency, they can apply those uh, remediation uh, minerals to that particular plant because it was grown in a particular area of the field that wasn't perhaps getting its full uh, nutrient component to grow, and then it moves on to the next plant. The only argument I have with that suggestion is that, well, gee, if you're worried about the the, the nutrients and you're worried about the the diseases that you may see, the robot may see, or the insects that it may see, why not get rid of those three things by doing aquaponics? Exactly. Because those those are more minimized in a controlled uh, system. And of course, mm-hmm. not aquaponic. All aquaponics uh, systems are sealed. Most of the hydroponic systems that you see, where food is being grown under uh, artificial light, they're sealed up, and they certainly don't have as many of the disease and insect uh, issues. And certainly, they have machines that can deliver exactly the kinds of nutrients you want. But in a uh, living ecosystem aquaponics facility like John has uh, developed, uh, you want Mother Nature to be uh, responsible for a lot of that and hopefully uh, there will be some kind of a system to help control and monitor that de- developed in the future. Okay. Huh. Agbots. I've never heard of this. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I heard about it about a year ago and this is the first time that Dr. Kurzweil's newsletter reported on it. I'm sure they use solar energy to walk along the farm and they're wandering through the, the irrigation ditches and maybe they're floating along with the nutrients. I don't know. But I think even Epcot Center and I should also point out that Probably the reason I'm here talking to you now is because many years ago, I visited Epcot Center down in uh, Florida, and I went through the uh, craft pavilion, the land pavilion, and I saw plants growing in sand, and I saw aeroponics. I saw the, the roots being sprayed with, with nutrients, and that's what got me here. They, 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 had, they had a little film strip showing robots that were sort of flying above the crops and applying nutrients. And at one point, you heard a communication between the control center that was controlling these robots saying, well, it looks like there's uh, rain coming in right now, so I guess the uh, robots don't need to uh, dispense any uh, water on the crops. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So Mother Nature will still be with us even when we do perhaps bring artificial intelligence expert system and robots into the mix to help the humans feed themselves. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Wow, that that's that's mind boggling. Uh, and if my history is any indication, this uh, probably won't happen for another twenty five years because once again I'm at this party and you are and your listeners are awful early, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and, and we are paving the way for uh, people to come behind us, learn from our mistakes, learn from our successes, and maybe they'll be the ones that make a whole lot of money at this and feed a whole lot of people and uh, do really good things in this area. And I, I have no problem with that either. Yeah, I think my major goal is uh, very much in alignment with what Max Myers is doing, which is integrating permaculture, which is really the the heart and core of all of my experience and where I'm coming from in, in the aquaponics world. It's coming from a lens of permaculture and sure. this this holistic, big picture approach. And then you know, aquaponics is is a lot of those permaculture principles just by itself and it's an it's it's an incredible technology and way to harness old wisdom with new technology there and pumps go. and things so we're taking what 
the Aztecs or the people before the Aztecs were doing when they were creating islands with with branches and raising up these islands, these man-made islands in the huge lake, the lake that was Mexico City at one point. And and basically farming with canoes and growing the plants on these islands, these man-made islands. And I mean, that's the origins of aquaponics. I'm sure aquaponics w- was practiced in a lot of different cultures, like you said, the Chinese. And I'm sure a lot of people realize the edge effect, which is a permaculture term for when two ecotones meet or ecosystems meet like a forest and a valley or a river and a forest, you got, you have more biodiversity on the edge of that than you would in either ecosystem. And that is what aquaponics is doing. It's bringing in, it's designing like a river, you know, growing fish and plants with, with river banks, but we're doing it through, you know, media and rafts and vertical. I mean, we're recreating it, but we're using nature as our template and we're using permaculture principles that we found from nature that work. And so I'm thinking, well, okay, now how do we integrate that even on a more macro level in the landscape and healing the landscape with our overflow, with growing trees, creating tree nurseries so we can plant them in the ground later I I have very soil remediation. Soil remediation. Some- yeah, all that stuff. Like I want to learn holistically how we can apply aquaponics on a on a grand scale, on a macro scale for healing the planet and healing you know nutritional deficiencies and, and cultural cultural economic socio economic problems that we have by having more access to organic fresh foods using less water and that is the that is literally that's the biggest picture right there well scaling is the big issue with aquaponics certainly from the smallest units that has its own particular benefits and and issues to the large commercial scale units i mean there there are aquaponic growing greenhouses in dubai in the middle of the uh, the desert that have just the scale is humongous and where does it where do you want to be in that you just want to have a system and a cul-de-sac in a neighborhood where you're sharing the output of your carrot aquaponic system with the output of the next guy's basil aquaponic system you know there's there's lots of ways of implementing this to uh, benefit of a small community to a uh, to a, a large city to the world and aquaponic has a place, I think, in all three of those uh, domains. Yeah, I would say, you know, we can take the same old uh, agricultural, conventional agricultural principles that are leading leading the world right now, and that is monoculture, or we can use aquaponics in a revolutionary way to create more diversity in our food choices, which is really where I see it going. I know it's easy to produce, you know, thousands of of heads of lettuce, but we need lots of kinds of crops. We need crops that a lot of people aren't growing. We need heirlooms. We need to start growing our seed banks so that we can have access to these seeds for thousands of years, because as you know, a lot of our seeds are being, being undermined. And I I think we need to we need to use aquaponics in a way that is is not just feeding people. It's creating medicine. It's creating biomass, mulch. Also creating jobs. And creating jobs, yeah, and teaching people about how these systems work in in nature and how we can recreate them. I mean, yeah, we we need to relearn, repattern how we live with our food and the way that it's grown. So, and it's just seeing how we can mimic nature in ways that are going to be beneficial and not just, you know, planting huge facilities of aquaponics, like in the middle of a forest, obviously, but in the middle of a desert. Yeah, sure. And creating diversity through that so that maybe that facility can create or assist the healing of the land around it by creating more biomass or, you know, more, more like things like comfrey that have so much biomass. They grow so fast that you can just harvest it from the system, put it on the ground, mulch the ground and let the ground heal. You're preaching to the choir here. Hail to the kale. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, th- I guess it's important that we share our vision so that absolutely we, we can see the future coming and we're definitely paving the way. So just want to inspire as much as possible and share practical information for how we can do this. 
And that's what's nice right now because a lot of the practitioners, visionaries in this nascent industry, that's exactly what they're doing. They are sharing their successes and their failures. They're the people that are mostly talking are the ones that have the experience to do this. I mean, a lot of people are maybe trying to make some money just producing seminars for people, but they've never grown a head of lettuce, but they've seen all the, uh, the, the YouTube videos and they're trying to profit from, from that. Hopefully that's going to go away too. Yeah. And I mean, we definitely have farmers and gardeners who love growing food and we have people who, who are into permaculture, but we also have people who don't know anything about business. And so I want to yep. fuse the different interests here. We have people who do want to grow food and they don't know how to start a business. And we have people who know how to start a business and know how to automate systems, but they don't know about plants or they don't know uh, how to set up a farmer's market or set up a school organization. I mean, so we need to collectively harness these different specialties. Multiple disciplines, and yeah. Multiple disciplines so that we can create the school organizations that are going to have the aquaponic systems and, and get the green thumbs in there, learning about how to do it with water and then teaching other people how to do it because they're passionate about the growing part. And we got people who are the builders who are really interested in the greenhouse and the renewable energy side of things and how to make it passive solar. And people who know the business side and the financial financial side of how to make it into a commercially viable business or a financially sustainable business for an organization. Well, we're certainly at the beginning stages of all those things. And the more that talk, it's talked about, evangelized and shared, the, the quicker it'll happen and the better it will be. Are, do you have any more jewels of inspiration, Gary, that you'd like to leave our Visioner <laughs> Aquaponics listeners? Boy, I, again, my biggest urging would be to Get involved. Either do it yourself or find an aquaponics farm and do an internship. There's something called the Woofer program. Are you, are you familiar with the Woofers? Absolutely. This is it gives you an opportunity to go to work on a farm and, and learn by doing. And then if you get a chance to attend a, a course given by somebody that's been vetted as somebody who really knows their stuff, they've done this before. I'd attend those, those kinds of talks. Those are being given regionally. There are user groups, which again reminds me just of the 70s when there was computer user groups. This is happening now in aquaponics. I would attend those and ask people questions there. Uh, okay, just do it. Just you got to do it. You got to get some money together and get something to hold the fish, something to hold the plants, something to move the water and and do it. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think we aquaponicists or aquaponic visionaries have trouble with is finding other people like us nearby who we can network sure. with. So I really think that as part of this vision to grow in a global aquaponics movement, we need to also grow our networks and have more people, person-to-person -person contact with other people who are professionally successful teaching it and also learning it or built, growing school organizations and things like that. So we, the more we network, the more we can empower other people who are just starting out to really get in the game and, and start where they are at their local school or in their backyard right now. And certainly I've noticed just recently uh, a couple of things. One is that the interest of um, in aquaponics is growing in Google. The trend is going up. I've noticed that there are lots of forums, aquaponics forums, that you not only can uh, interact with these experts, but you can read back and search for issues that you might be having and find out how they were solved. And uh, along the lines of what something you just said, this has been in the last week I've discovered this, there's actually a map now, a Google map, which shows where aquaponics facilities have been uh, set up and what they are and how to contact them. And all I can see happening is that map is going to be getting more and more populated as time goes by so that people will be able to find these kinds of places uh, in their local areas. Thank you so much, Gary. You've been a wealth of information and inspiration. My pleasure. Come visit School Grown when you're out in California next, and I'm probably going to see you in Texas at the next Aquaponics uh, Association convention. Oh, I'm so there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Visionary Aquaponics Podcast. To learn more about aquaponics, please visit our website at www.visionaryaquaponics.com. There you'll find more strategies, tips, and tricks to get you started in your aquaponics journey.